Hi, hello, Sharda Ogra here. Welcome to this uh, episode of Out of the Park. We are halfway through the World Cup and I thought it would be a good time to talk to someone who's actually inside it. Inside it as parts of the nuts and the bolts of the operation. Most of us are watching the World Cup on our television screens. And I thought today I should speak to Hemant Butch, uh, who's a, again a, a long time friend, but a very seasoned broadcaster and a and a very seasoned uh, a producer of, of cricket, cricket programs, and the impossibility of live cricket. So before I get into all the other stuff about the World Cup, I'll be chatting with Hemant. Um, you know, who are the people that uh, that do this job? What kind of people do you need? And how does this entire operation uh, come together? So here we go, and let's have a little chat with Hemant. Delighted today to be speaking to Heyman Butch, uh, whom I know I've known since uh, Yonks. Uh, you know, Heyman is broadcaster. He's a director of one of the World Cup games that you're watching. And basically the people, uh, for a change, he's in front of the camera rather than behind it, directing all its ways. Heyman, welcome to Out of the Park. So good to have you here. Thank you, Shada. Always a pleasure to chat with you. Um, so we're going to talk uh, today, uh, Hemant, about this business of broadcasting and how important it is in making cricket the sport that it is in terms of its media rights value and the fact that what you and your team do has led to uh, this point where we, where we are today because cricket's a game uh, that is captured so much through television. Uh, we can see so much more on our television screens than we could say about 20, 25 years ago. Um, so. It, it plays a very big role in how cricket is seen by uh, the, the the industry, the the market, uh, uh, so to speak. Um, so heyman has been in the business for almost 30 years. Uh, he would have been in charge of covering about over a thousand days of cricket. Uh, that is test matches, one day games, 2020 leagues. Uh, so, you know, heyman has got a lot of uh, uh, experience. He's got a lot of crazy stories. So we're looking forward to a fun conversation. Um, the first uh, World Cup that Heyman covered was the 1996 World Cup, which was uh, uh, held in India uh, in collaboration with Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Uh, that was the first time. And now he's he's here. He's one of the directors, like I said, at, at the, the 2023 World Cup. Hemant, tell me what this business and this profession has looked like in the years that you've been involved from the beginning, uh, say 94, if I remember correctly, all the way to now. Well, yeah, this business, uh, as with all businesses, has changed. Uh, there are many things that have that have improved there are some things that have remained the same and as with a lot of things there are some things that have uh, gone backward but overall i would suggest that uh, you know as far as viewing pleasure is concerned as far as a lot of different things are concerned uh, broadcasting has moved forward uh, the you know we used to have single sided coverage at at times you know before i came into the profession we changed to you know cover cricket from both sides which gave you a much more front on view of things and um, yeah, the number of cameras has has exponentially increased. Uh, the quality of the lenses, the quality of the replay equipment, uh, you know, the the light gathering capabilities, the the quality of the lights at stadiums, uh, all of that has has gone, you know, uh, has has improved exponentially. The frame rates of cameras uh, has has improved. Um, and, you know, at uh, when when I started, the maximum was about 60 frames per second. Now it's over 1000 frames per second. You know, so there is there is a huge difference in, in quality um, as well as the quantity of cameras. More and more cameras have come in. Um, yeah, but that, of course, has brought in more and more ads, especially in the subcontinent. So, the, you know, these are there are there are these different aspects of of the game uh, for viewers. Some may like them, some may not. Some may look back and and say the good old days were much better. Uh, some would would say that uh, you know the new age is better. I think uh, you know as far as quality of of pictures is concerned, there there is no doubt the new age is better. But then, you know, there are there are other things that would have been better in in the earlier times. Uh, so before we get to that, Heyman, can you just tell everyone watching how many personnel do you need, say, when you're going to cover, you're, you're going to be you're in charge, you're the director at a World Cup game, how many people are involved there? And of course, because we love numbers, do you know how many length of how many kilometers of cable you carry with you? So just the number of personnel it takes to put together the production that we're seeing every day at this World Cup. Well, uh... I, it would be over 150 personnel. Um, here it would be even more because there are 
um, you know, the host broadcaster star also have their own personnel. So it would be over 200, 250 people. Uh, there's there's a lot of lot of things that go into into this. If you add people like drivers and and you know, catering staff and all of that, just for the crew, that would be even more. It would go to maybe 250 or 300. So yeah, I mean, there, there are there are a lot lots and lots of people involved uh, in in this. Cables, it depends upon the ground, <laughs> depends upon, but, but you know, there is, it would, it would be, you know, hundreds of kilometers of cable, uh, just the mess behind, uh, behind where the engineers sit, where all the cables come in. I mean, that, that is, I, I it's, it's just impossible for people to understand that all this is put together in, in three days from scratch. They're all taken out from boxes, all these cables, you know, all these boxes become machines and then cables are, are put in and they go into the right place and everything then eventually works and then as the match gets over everything is packed up all the cables are dismantled rolled up put into boxes all the machines go back in their boxes and then they go to the next venue and then they're assembled there as well so it's it's an immense operation and it takes a lot of skill uh to to get it right and you know when people complain that things go mm -hmm. wrong well, there are so many things that can go wrong. The fact that they only go wrong a few times is is testament to the ability of the people, you know, the technicians and everybody who make this happen. This is, uh, you know, there's so many things that can go wrong. Live production, you know, when when we, I, I used to be a journalist, like, as you know, and, and if you write a story, you can go back, read it, a sub-editor reads it, then then, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, corrects the story. There is, in live, there are no corrections. What goes out, goes out. So, yeah, there are mistakes that happen, but just just remember that uh, the fact that they are so few and far between uh, means uh, that you know you're in very very good hands as far as viewing pleasure is concerned. So you know, before we get to all the sort of stuff that all of us viewers complain about, too many ads, too many breaks, too many cuts. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is, for someone who's a director, who's a broadcaster yourself, you're the person who's responsible for putting those pictures out uh, on our TV screen. What are the sort of physical and mental stresses of the job that are there? Because it's a, it's, it lasts. I mean, you would be. What are the, what are your working hours if you're going to a game? It's, it's almost like they never end. Because well before journalists reach the ground, the TV guys are there. They're always there before us. No matter how early we, early we go, they're always there. So yeah, I mean, like yesterday uh, in Pune, we we left the hotel around nine thirty. And I reached the hotel, I think it was about uh, 12, 12.30 or so at night. So it was a long day, uh, particularly because, uh, you know, there was there was a huge traffic jam on the way back and took us one and a half hours to get back. But yeah, it, it all takes a toll because you then move on to the next venue or, or you set up for the next game. So there is, there is the long hours pressure, especially in one day games, which is 100 overs. T20s not as much, but still, and and of course there is there is this pressure of getting things right on the fly. There are uh, for a director uh, there are uh, you know five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten voices in their ear all the time. Uh, you're talking to lots of people. You're issuing different instructions. You're making decisions on the spot. You're you're choosing what camera to cut, what replay to take, what graphic to take. You're also conveying that to the commentators to make sure that they are on the same page as you when you're putting the pictures out so that they're, they're they're able to talk you know knowledgeably about what's coming up or wh what's happening on screen uh, you you're also talking to stats to to the producer who's who's telling you what you might need to put in uh, you know the, on the next ball so so you you're planning you're executing you're uh, you're watching you're you're talking you're doing all that at the same time so so there are those pressures and it's non-stop because uh, it's not as if you sit there for uh, you know 30 minutes then you get a break you don't get a break you sit there and uh, and you're there on a on a 12 13 hour day and and you 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 basically just watching about you know 60 70 80 screens uh, at one point and um, and 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 you don't you don't get a break so yeah there are there are all those all those pressures and sometimes things go wrong sometimes uh, you know uh, machines fail as as they are wont to do and and then you you to make plans on the fly there uh, so you know there there are there are lots and lots of things that come into the equation you need to be able to think straight and you need to be able to not panic which is which is the 
which is the main thing so it's sounding like you know uh, you're saying that odi is actually uh, of the three formats are they the toughest to cover is, is the pace of test match broadcasting different in that sense because of the fact that it's played out over 7 hours is just 90 overs even though uh, uh, you know uh, odi is just 100 overs uh, so, so is it really because odi formats are getting hammered for every reason but this sounds like it's the toughest thing for a director and 2020s are saying is is far quicker in that sense Uh, yes so if if you're looking at 2020s it's a lot more intense because you you got to fit in a lot more things a lot more things happen you get less space to tell your stories and you need to get your stories out so you need to be a lot quicker you need to be a lot more decisive when when you're doing t20 cricket uh, you it's also sometimes less satisfying in that you're not able to tell as many stories as you would want to tell it's more Uh, you follow the play more um, rather than you know you, you the story you you telling the story the story is there and you need to you need to tell the viewers what's happening rather than in test cricket where where you can create stories when you can uh, you know sit and make um, you know analysis pieces and and graphics and you can you can talk about the history of the game there are a lot a uh, lot more lulls in play where uh, where you can you can you know uh, sort of indulge yourself because test cricket is a lot to do with history it's a lot to do with storytelling it's a lot to do with fables it's it's a lot to do with a lot of different things so you know it's a lot more romantic to cover in that in that mm-hmm. sense it's very satisfying it, it also has this habit of uh, you know having really soporific uh, <laughs> you know uh, sessions of play and then suddenly springing into life uh, and and you know then it becomes the most satisfying match of your life so so those those things um, happen you know a lot more than they used to actually now in test cricket because there are a lot more results and uh, odis fall somewhere in between there um, you know uh, the last world cup was was phenomenal because um, <laughs> you know, the, of the way it ended um, lots of boring matches at the start uh, lots of rained off matches people sort of cribbing about so much rain why should the world cup be held in england and all of that and then suddenly people only remember the last game which was perhaps the greatest game uh, of one day cricket ever played so then everybody thinks that world cup was awesome uh, right now you know we haven't had as many close games we've, we've had uh, you know a couple of upsets so people saying that oh this is you know it's it's boring but who knows how it ends if you have the last three four matches as humdingers if india wins everybody will say one day cricket is 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 awesome so it's it's a lot to do with here and now it's a lot to do with uh, you know instant recall in this day and age um this this you know yeah for me a one day cricket becomes uh, a little the uh, more uh, uh challenging to cover because it falls between two stools uh we used to really love one day cricket it used to be cutting edge sort of uh, of of the sport we there was so much excitement and now it seems a little formulaic you have a certain formula in the first 10 then you have a little formula in the middle and then a formula towards the end but again having said that uh, you know if if you look at it that way India's greatest batsman of of this day and age, perhaps the strongest format at this moment is One Day Cricket. If you look at Virat, if you look at Rohit, if you look at KL Rahul, One Day Cricket at this point seems to be uh, where uh, where they are the most comfortable. So, I I don't know. I mean, each each format has its strengths, and you know, on different days, uh, you look at different formats and say that okay, this format is the best. But it keeps changing with with the last match you watched, I guess. Uh, recency bias is something uh, that that is in everyone's mind when it comes to deciding everything who are the greatest players and you'll name like someone you saw like 5 years ago rather than someone you saw 20 25 years ago uh, hemant uh, are there times that you just wish you didn't enjoy the job or does it feel like a job uh, what is your favorite day as a director you know the being master of the cricket universe at that time what's your what's your favorite day of how that of that day turned out if you can remember one maybe a couple whatever you know i mean asking for a favorite is idiotic because you've covered 1000 days of cricket and 125 test matches so uh, any memorable day that you that you remember does it at times does it feel like a drag like oh god it's a job or it's not really a job 
no i i mean uh, when when i was not working i was watching cricket anyway so uh, to get paid to watch cricket or any sport is is uh, is phenomenal i mean we're talking about cricket i just did the table tennis world championships in durban and that was phenomenal i did the india open badminton that was awesome as well yes it feels a drag sometimes when because the hours are long and you don't get a break uh, but but yeah it's not something that you would want to trade for anything in the world because uh, you know you you look at people who earn a lot of money uh, you know going you know dressed in a tie and uh, and a and a coat <laughs> and stuff to work um, and and you look at them and you you're grateful I, you know i actually worked in a bank uh, for for one day um and uh, and i had to wear a coat and a tie and you know uh, go dress to the nines and i decided i was never going back the next day so yeah i mean i i don't know what i would have done if not for sport so i'm i'm always grateful uh, to be part of of this uh, sort of work environment and any and, and your memorable day like your most fun day in which it was like just everything came together or a memorable day not the most a memorable day that you cannot absolutely forget i mean that uh, i tend to forget uh, you know every day but it's it's easier to remember days when you were not working because uh, with with <laughs> this it, it is so intense that you sort of end up forgetting i you know when when i finish a match i i don't even remember what happened in that match a lot of times because hmm. you know you 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 you're so you, you're looking at it as a as a story you you know you you're so caught up in it at that point in time and and when uh when the match ends uh, there is there is that sort of exhalation and and then you just want to relax because you know you get back to the room late at night and if you're still thinking about the match you can't sleep so it's actually even a conscious decision to sort of immediately forget about it then think about it the next day but yeah there have been some games which have not been very fashionable games but there was like this test match between zimbabwe and uh uh and pakistan in in harare where uh, you know i i had planned uh, i had planned a trip i had, you know i thought that uh, zimbabwe would get knocked over in 3 days and uh, you know i'd have a nice wildlife trip for <laughs> for another 3 days and we'd we'd planned it out accordingly and then eventually on the last day uh, zimbabwe ended up winning uh, and and that was phenomenal because the players i remember the story was that the players had not been paid and yes, they suddenly yes. got paid and and, and we had gone to this this market uh, where, where they sell curios and you know knock off t-shirts and stuff and there was one of the players was buying t-shirts on the day he got paid he was there buying t-shirts for himself so yeah oh. it was it, it was yeah it was quite surreal so so that that sort of you remember there was this uh series uh, in pakistan when india went there in uh, 2003 was it uh, or 4 yeah 3 4 uh, so, yeah. yeah so that 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 was phenomenal for for the quality of cricket the matches that were played the fact that imran khan uh, was 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 there with us uh, uh, you know as as part of our commentary team and and his his presence in the studio was was so regal and you know we we Uh, it it was a great time you know we were, we were greeted uh, so well everywhere and and it was it was a great time to be you know part of the cricketing universe then and and every match was uh, was brilliant yeah. there uh, i mean it's it's not something that you can never forget so uh, it's it's given me uh, you know cricket has given me the opportunity to travel to many places that i would never have be, uh, been to uh, you know new zealand four five times you know the caribbean uh, you've been to places like hong kong places like malaysia for cricket you know i did uh, i did the commonwealth games uh, not as a director but you know, uh, in in malaysia where, where cricket was held and uh, that was the first time i met viv richards uh, and uh, i sort of begged him for an interview and he agreed but uh, there was there was there was that time when uh, um there was political unrest in in kuala lumpur um and uh, with with mathir uh, and anwar and so my cameraman was also a political cameraman and i had to go and uh, cover that and and we had to make we wait and and then we said we waits for no man uh, so that interview <laughs> got canned 
that was also memorable so there are there are many of these moments that uh, that one never forgets uh, but uh, but yeah i mean there are so many that i'd come up with a lot more we wait for no man is is a great one um so one of the things that we've seen him month in the last uh, say uh, more than a decade is that the technology that's used by television to basically uh, give the viewers a better viewing experience has suddenly been brought into the rules of cricket like uh, the decision review system uh, what has been your response to this kind of almost <laughs> cannibalizing of broadcaster technology so okay now let's make our rules better through what the tv guys are doing yeah so that's that's the problem so uh, the onus then lies on uh, on television directors and and television personnel to make sure that uh, everything goes according to plan for uh, you know for for the umpires but if you look at other sports uh, if you look at hockey football even if they do it so badly uh, or or badminton or tennis or whatever they have their own setup uh, yes. here um, the setup is all the host broadcasters and it is used uh, by uh, you know uh, by the umpiring fraternity and uh, it is it is a little little bit unfair because uh, you know to to me um, you know to get dictated by them you, you've got to wait 15 seconds for a replay to come up for example and that took a long time now we have the drs clock but uh, if if a replay would come up you know there's there's a ball that has been bold. Nothing has really happened, and mm. uh, it just hit the pad somewhere, and nothing has happened. And you suddenly you you play out the replay, and then the umpire says, oh, "Why did you play the replay? It's not 15 seconds yet." Uh, you know, I'm I'm not counting your 15 seconds. I didn't think there was anything in it. Now, if somebody decides to go up for the appeal, you know, it's it's not really my lookout. But yeah, so all that one had to take into account. One had to consciously wait. Now you put up the clock, so. You know, you uh, you you got that timer with you as well, but again, there too a lot of times uh, things really don't don't happen, and and you and you go to the replay, and then suddenly somebody appeals because it's like the 48th over or of the game, mm -hmm. and they've got two replay uh, two uh, two reviews in hand, and they just go for it, uh, and then then you say, oh, oh, why did I go for that? Because uh, why why did I play the replay out? The umpire will come and tell you oh, you should have waited. So that that happens uh, rarely, but that happens, and yeah, also also technology. Um, you need to have people well versed in technology to be doing the job. Uh, you know, of the third umpire. Now they're more used to it. So yeah, so uh, you need to have people in umpiring for for the third umpire's role as as specialist third umpires. I think that would that would help. Uh, take out because uh, you know you you are uh, you are doing this job uh, and you can't really afford any errors uh, so if if you uh, it's not really interpretation that should be involved here so mm -hmm. while it is still very good and a lot better than something like the VAR in football it can get even better um, and and there are there are people who are more suited to this role than than some others. Uh, I know that most umpires prefer being on field than being the third umpire because, you know, as as an on field umpire, you can get away with a few things uh, because it is instant <laughs> and people understand that. While if you make a mistake uh, watching television, where everybody else is also watching television alongside you, you know there are uh, there are uh, you know 3.5 crore people watching and they're all umpires as well so yeah it's a it's a little difficult uh, if if you're if you're the television umpire you can't afford to have uh, make any mistakes whereas on field people understand so i i think this is this is a thing with technology it can it can get better maybe if they set up their own um, own sort of technological center it might yes. be better it would also help because at this point the broadcasters pay for the technology uh, and and uh, which is why you have different tiers of technology where uh, some yes. some board can afford more technology than others, um, and and you know so I, I to to make it a level playing field if if uh, the technology aspect for for DRS would be taken over uh, completely uh, by by the ICC it might make it easier. For for different boards as well, uh, 
it's less of a financial drain as well the various chats have been had about you know being a sponsor uh, universal sponsor but i don't think that has that has materialized obviously there must be some problem or the other uh, with that it's easy for us to sit back and uh, you know think about these things and and say these things but i'm sure there must be some issues with that the uh, you know uh, it's not that the icc icc doesn't have money per se a lot of money has come into cricket what has it been like uh, for uh, the people in in your business what what are salaries like uh, with all of you in broadcasting with tech with, with the people that are the technical people that are involved who have to do this uh, high stress very physical at the same time very draining physically mentally uh, a draining uh, job as well what what's that been like are the earnings fantastic are they exponentially rising like media rights or what, what's that business that side of the business like uh sadly uh, no uh, the earnings are uh, are uh, mostly stagnant especially in india where where the media rights have have gone through the roof um i don't know what the reason for that is but i don't think they have risen in about 20 years uh, they have probably gone down uh, for various reasons uh but mm. but it's it's different in different parts of the world uh in other parts of the world uh they they would have risen or at least remained the same uh but but in india they have they have gone down uh a little bit uh and if you look those that's in real terms in 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 terms of inflation uh there would be a substantial uh downturn i think as far as uh, as far as that is concerned but having said that uh, in in earlier days there there were very few professionals uh, involved in sport in india uh, it was mostly people coming from abroad uh, now there's so much sport happening uh, in in india uh, the some of the best technicians in the world are indian best cameramen top class evs operators very good engineers um, you know graphics operators directors producers uh, you know lots and lots of indians uh, so Uh, perhaps you know um, the the demand uh, and supply situation you know, maybe there is there is a huge amount of supply i don't know uh, there's also the fact that not everybody needs top quality as well people make do uh, in, in smaller productions so that that is that also leads to a sort of uh, you know pushing down the market rate at times it is uh, it is unfortunate because as you say people work very hard uh, but you know um, that's that's for people you know in uh, who, who who lead this to answer obviously people people uh, try to push down rates because that makes sense you know to to uh, for for the bottom line and if if some people agree uh, to work at that rate then there's nothing really that can be said about it and uh, and that's that's what happens so if people agree to work at that rate they can't really complain um if if they don't agree then they don't work so it's a, you know it works both ways uh, it's always in favor of the big players i guess so you know like what you're saying is i keep thinking of say uh, it agrees with the bottom line and the ceo's bonus but i won't take you there it's, it's not in uh, it's not in your <laughs> you know i don't want to take you there um so you've covered a lot you've been working a lot in these t20 leagues that are there uh, himant the way i am seeing it uh, i'm seeing that they're going to almost take over the game in the sense of the future of the game will largely be 2020 and some bespoke maybe uh, red ball cricket uh, that's my i keep saying uh, i did not call him and i said the earthquake is coming that was my that was my my, my scare line uh, what do you think that uh, which way the game is going to go because i think the financial pressures or the financial gains from 2020 cricket and the franchise leagues in the united states in south uh, in south africa in the in, in the emirates in india and all, all around the world uh, it's literally that they're going to spread over uh, the cricket calendar that's my like i said my my paranoid thought i wonder what you think about it well um, yeah i mean the, the thing with this is that how many leagues are making money that's that's the that's the question uh, that's that's not an answer i have but i i wonder uh, how many leagues make money some of the big leagues might but not every league makes money that's why you would see a lot of leagues scaling down their productions uh, the quality of of coverage going down i mean uh, i won't i won't take names but but there are 
you know there are several leagues not just not just cricket leagues in, in you know other sports as well uh, that that have scaled down they started very ambitiously but but went down um, i i don't think every league can survive it's great for players at this point in time it's great for te- uh, you know television uh, broadcast professionals as well because uh, you know there is uh, there is a lot of work around uh, some of these places you don't get paid which is which is another story uh, you know some of some of these leagues uh, people end up going and working and 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 they don't get uh, end up getting paid it's it's it you know with the players at least there is uh fika or somebody protects their their interests the professional mm-hmm. cricketers association with broadcasters there's, there's really nobody so that's that's there as well but yeah there are there are a lot of these uh, these leagues um, not sure how many will will end up being successful eventually i think there will there will be a separation uh, wheat and the chaff and uh, we will we will have uh, you know top 4 5 6 leagues maybe uh, succeeding not not this plethora of leagues mm. that that going around the world um i i hope that test cricket survives i hope that uh, bilateral cricket survives um because yeah eventually uh, otherwise unlike in football where uh, i keep going back to football but with clubs there is an identity that somebody who plays for that club plays for that one club uh, you know throughout and then they get the transfer to some other club so there is there is that identity here you know somebody comes in plays 15 days for for one team then goes mm-hmm. and plays another 15 days not not the players fault nobody's fault really but there is there is not i mean i i struggle to remember who plays for which team in the ipl like you know i was just I thought that was me i thought that was my problem yeah. i thought i had a problem with it <laughs> that that is the biggest biggest league uh, there is uh, imagine so mm-hmm. uh, and and again i mean that's 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 the nature of the beast that that will that will happen but i i don't know how many people will be able to name every franchise that say uh faf du plessy plays for or or an imran tahir plays for it's it's difficult and uh, i mean i i think that players need to be identified with teams to make it make it work really uh, and that might mean that something like the ipl becomes a nearly year long thing with with international breaks in between that that can happen mm-hmm. uh, maybe one or two other leagues uh, go in so you you have three or four tiers of leagues you know like like you have uh, the english premier league and and uh, uh, la liga and then uh, you know serie a and then you, you have the bundesliga so you have different tiers of leagues maybe maybe that happens and and you have much longer leagues Uh, happening and then you have little international breaks uh, and you play international cricket then but but again um, the, the problem there is that cricket is a very seasonal uh, sport and and we play in different hemispheres and we play at different times so to make all that work will be really really tough and that will mean that certain boards will fall by the wayside uh, which will be unfortunate because very few boards actually uh, play cricket at the highest level we we like cricket to spread uh, for better or worse it's t20 that's going to spread because again for teams to have the depth for test cricket is a lot to ask for so like i was saying i am on the earthquake is coming but <laughs> but just before we let you go thanks so much for the conversation can you would you like to give us your four semi finalists of the world cup we won't ask for the winner we'll, we'll say four semi finalists you've been watching it far more closely with 80 cameras at one go so what do you think it's it's quite difficult to tell at this point in time i i think at this point uh, india and new zealand uh, will will make it but if hardik pandya is unfit then i you know i don't uh, don't think india has a chance of winning the entire event because the entire balance goes for a toss um australia seem to be coming into their own uh, and i can't really write england off uh, at any point in time uh so i i think at this point in time though i would have loved to have put pakistan among the uh among the semi finalists on on today's performance there's a tv on there and 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 pakistan are getting hammered by australia at this point 
I would have to go Australia over Pakistan though I would before today I would have gone Pakistan over Australia Hey man great talking to you uh, enjoy the rest of the world cup uh, send us great pictures thank you very much from the from, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the vast audience that is watching for all the work that uh, you and your team do thank you very much again Thank you Sharda lovely to touch, chat with you as you saw and heard, Hemant had so many things to say about the business. Uh, we couldn't talk a lot about the commentators and the individual foibles and their egos and so on. Maybe that's for another day because the, that that is that is very much a part of the broadcasting experience. You know, who gets to do uh, who gets to do man of the match? Who gets to do uh, the toss? Who gets to do the, the the final overs? How do they decide all these things? Too much to talk about over over what was a long conversation, but uh, without all the sort of gritty, nitty gritty details in it, which we will get later, I promise you, in some somehow or the other. Maybe I'll get him back again once the whole thing is um, done and wrapped up. So, like I said, we're at, at the halfway stage. India are looking scarily formidable. And for a lot of us fans from 1990s, we just sort of, we've got our fingers crossed. Uh, as we've seen, what's happened is that uh, because... Uh, very few teams tend to want to put the opposition into bat. Um, you've seen that India have uh, chased in all of their single games. They won just a couple of tosses. Uh, they've chased in all of their games. Partly the reason could be because of the weather. Uh, teams don't want to be fielding at about uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon of the, in, 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 in all the places. It's, it's unbearably hot. We saw what happened with England when they played uh, in Mumbai. So that's definitely a factor. India ha haven't actually ha had the opportunity to set up a total. That's one thing. The other thing that has shown up uh, at this World Cup is uh, the other opposite trend that the death overs have almost fallen off the cliff. You know, because all the action seems to be happening between, say, over number 25 to over number 40. That's the, that's the, which was supposed to be the boring middle overs. But that's when you see teams are either stepping in and taking wickets and, and therefore breaking what may have been a great start by uh, by the opposition team or you're seeing teams that are able to sort of break through and, and then put in as many runs as they can at that at that particular point in time because maybe spinners have come into play then um, and they're able to maybe see if they can get a lot more runs. Uh, we've seen that uh, we've seen that England's fortunes have fallen. Uh, Australia are struggling a bit, but you've got sort of India, South Africa, New Zealand are the three teams that look th that they're very much there on the way to uh, the semi-finals. Teams need to win about six games, or I said five, and, and with the, with a little bit of luck about the net run rate. Um, so that's the that's the other thing that's that's happening. You're seeing uh, the oh, the top order batsmen, I say the top the openers and, and and number three that are able to basically control uh, both the chase and the setting up of a total. That they're able to basically just go for it right at the beginning and say let's not leave too much for the end overs guys to do because fast bowlers are coming on in about the fortieth over and and uh, as we've seen with the Indians. Um, um, they they brought on their, their, their fast bowlers around the 40th over against uh, uh, against uh, New Zealand. This looks like it's a it's it's a kind of a World Cup where the top three batsmen are able to basically set the pace, particularly in the chase. We've seen the Indians do it very very successfully. Rohit Sharma and Virat Kohli they're able to just go out and 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 get as many runs right at the beginning in the earlier power uh, early power plays and not wait uh, for say the late like I said the death overs to to try and push it and just do all the work and destroy the destroy the required run rate well before uh, well well before time because teams are bringing back their top bowlers like their uh, wicket taking pace bowlers for example in the 40th over um, like uh, India, India does very, very su uh, successfully. If you actually want to see uh, the plan that's playing out in this World Cup, you should follow what the Indians are doing in terms of how they they shuffle their bowlers around, uh, the bowling changes that they make. Um, you know, because that that gives you an indication of what's happening uh, in terms of how this game is being played. Um, in a lot of the stats that we that we're reading about, you, you can follow it on Crick Info and so on. You're being told that the that the um, you know the, the first. 15 over run rates have gone have gone pre, uh, sky high and the death over run rates have, have kind of um, the last 10 over run rates have kind of fallen because of the fact that either the work's already been done and you don't need to do too much or that all the damage has already been done in those middle overs and then you're struggling to basically keep the innings together and push through uh, right till the end. So like I said, uh, a, a game that is, I mean, a, a, a tournament that is sort of made for this early onset of these uber aggressive batsmen and um, very little for the bowlers other than the fact that the really highly skilled ones that are there uh, before i go on to um, the talk about like 
this other second segment, which is the fan voice, I wanted to point out a beautiful uh, clip done of Trent Bolt talking about his mindset going into his bowling. What 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 goes through his mind when he's about to bowl? It's a beautiful, almost like just a half a minute clip, uh, which you'll see a little bit uh, um, of. Uh, you'll get a little bit of a link to show you what's going through his mind as he as he as he comes up to bowl. Um, and the most I thought the most wonderful thing about it was he said just before he's about to bowl his first ball, he just has a smile, and that's for his children, because he says you know he's so grateful to be where he is, and he gives a little smile, and then he's on his way to break toes, break stumps, whatever it is um, that, the, that, that the great Trent Bolt does. On to the fan voice now, the voices of the fans. I was a fan. I went to watch the Australia versus Pakistan match on the, uh, in the stands. And I'll tell you a little bit about my experience in some time. Uh, but what I must point out is uh, a very, very revealing and very, very revealing and, and quite awful video was awful in the sense of it, the content that it had that it shows us that was awful, not the fact that the video was put up. Uh, was done on October the 18th from Dharamshala. Um, it was actually just a very it's short clip. It's about 21 seconds and shows you what the toilets in Dharamshala were like. Now you're looking at Dharamshala, beautiful background, fantastic. Never mind the outfield, great uh, uh, superb location, the Himalayas, all the rest of it. And when this video came out, it had this really yucky, dirty sort of a toilet. There was water on the floor, and uh, and and the person who put this up on Facebook, he said, "Oh, ये हालत है Dharamshala stadium की bathroom की. Stadium तो पूरा चमका के रखते हैं." लेकिन अंदर दिखा दो मैं बाथरूम के ये देखो ये बेचारे बांग्लादेश से आए हैं ये भी क्या सोच रहे होंगे कि कितने गंदे बाथरूम है यहाँ के तो अनुराग ठाकुर को मेरे ख्याल से दिखे ना दिखे हमें तो दिखता है यार ये देखो कितनी गंदी हालत है यहाँ पे बाथरूम की the person who put up the Facebook clip, you hear his audio and he's saying, stadium to pura chamka ke rakhte hai ye, lekin andar uh, bathroom dikhta hai. And then he goes on to show you uh, this uh, poor Bangladeshi fan who's standing there in the middle of this really yucky bathroom. And he says, ye bichare Bangladesh se aaye hai, ye bhi sochte honge ki kitne ba uh, gande bathroom hai, hai yaha ke. And it just shows you that this is the side of the ground where obviously you're not getting the, the commentators and the players are not coming through. This is the public that's coming through then for this uh for this uh ticket that uh, this match that i went to australia versus uh, pakistan um uh, the karnataka state cricket association put up the prices for the tickets which i will uh, read out to you um the price for the p terrace which is a beautiful seat was twenty five thousand rupees right and the lowest ticket was the h lower so i was sitting in what was h upper the h lower which is a square stand uh it was uh the, so my seat was technically 3000 rupees and the H lower was a thousand rupees. So you're talking about, this is a match in which there is no Indian participation. I would think, and then you're going on the ticket prices are a thousand rupees, 3000 rupees, 5,000 rupees for the C stand. The corporate boxes are six and a half thousand. Um, the executive boxes were 9,000. The, the end stand which is a beautiful uh, top of the wicket stand opposite the, the clubhouse and the, and the diamond box and so on. Um, that was 15,000 rupees. And there was a grand terrace which was 12,000 rupees. Now you're looking at these prices, just convert them into pounds. Yeah, If you convert them into, in, into pounds, that's 250 pounds for the most expensive ticket for a match that is not even a knockout game in which India is not even playing. So you're thinking, uh, is, is the Karnataka State Cricket Associations, other state cricket associations that do this, um, what is this logic of pricing the tickets this high? Are they trying to earn an income from tickets? Do you think that the KSCA or state associations don't earn good enough income that they need to price tickets like this? It sounds outrageous. So this was uh, for the price on October, the, or for, the, for the match on October the 20th. Um, on October the 26th, which is the next match, uh, it's the same, 200 pounds, 20,000 rupees for for uh, the most expensive ticket and 750 rupees, for which we should be grateful, for uh, the cheapest uh, sort of price ticket that's there. It's it's absolutely outrageous the way these uh, tickets are, are, the ticket pricing is done. It's almost like they don't want the tickets to sell. Uh, and uh, at that, then there's another, so this is the 20th, on October the 22nd, uh, this is the stadium from a, uh, this is a comment from uh, on a, a Twitter message uh, about a match in the Vankhede Stadium, England versus South Africa. You can't carry water inside and you can't even buy water bottles inside. There is free water available and you can also buy water in a glass. But this means you have to leave your seat and go to the counter every time you want to drink water. In the stand, they only sell you a drinks, cold coffee, ice cream and snacks, but no water. Fans and audience make the game. Going to a match shouldn't feel like you're walking into a prison. Uh, instead of making life difficult for fans, 
from other nations, perhaps Indians should ask questions to BCCI about how the richest cricket board still can't make the fan experience better. So this is a very, very heartfelt sort of fan uh, experience from one kid. So we are talking about Bangalore, uh, where the ticket pricing is absolutely over the top and ridiculous. Just before the game, I spoke to a, a, a fan who had gone to the Qatar World Cup final. And he bought a ticket which was not the most expensive ticket that day, but it was just about uh, there or thereabouts, close. And his ticket was about 275 US dollars, which if you're saying, so 300 US dollars is about, say, uh, 24,000 plus 25, it's about 25,000 rupees. This is a World Cup soccer final ticket. And, and you're saying 25,000 rupees is a P-terrace ticket for India versus Pakistan, uh, for Australia versus Pakistan and for England versus, uh, um, for the uh, for New Zealand versus uh, Sri Lanka match that's going to happen in KSC. It is mind-boggling who comes up with these uh, ticket prices. Mm. So that's what you're telling about the, about the fan uh, experience. Let me also tell you about my experience at the ground. What the fan of the Vankade Stadium said, absolutely correct about the water. There was food. It wasn't uh, it wasn't badly priced at all. It was reasonably priced. Uh, and the other thing that I saw that was happening at the at the game is, of course, there was a, it was a great atmosphere. The crowd was not, uh, it wasn't jammed. It wasn't, uh, there was a great atmosphere. The stadium was not full. The seats that were empty were the end stand. So it had a very, very, maybe 40% of the crowd was there. The members stand, which is where members should supposedly get, prefer they should get first off of the tickets. Uh, I was told that uh, that was not done for some people. I don't know if, if it was the case for all. The member stand was also very sparsely uh, occupied. So the H stand where I was sitting and the other square stand and, and a couple, the, so the ground was about, the numbers that came out was between 25 and 30,000, it's about say 70%. 75 percent full it was a, it was a nice stadium it was i mean it was a nice atmosphere uh, you had the uh, you had the uh, because pakistan was playing they played dil dil pakistan which is a song that they played on the pa system and there wasn't any major sort of <laughs> the, the word the sky didn't fall um but there was a group of fans that felt that that was the time to start chanting uh, felt that, that, that there was a time to start chanting Vande Mataram, Bharat Mata Ki Jai, and you know, for, and you're saying that India is not playing this game, but therefore, I mean, you're a fan, you're allowed to shout. Who knows? You, we saw some clips um, on uh, on the uh, on on social media about how policemen tried to stop a Pakistan fan from cheering for his own team. There were Pakistan fans in the audience, not many, but they were there. So you had these sort of mixed uh, experiences. The ground, so I entered from the, basically like the Janta stand from the, from the behind the, uh, like there's a parallel road behind the thing, which is quite uneven and absolutely no, um, you know, it was dirty and so on, but it was fine, it was easy to get in. People waited for a long time to get access into the ground for, again, reasons that are understood um, by, by, by Indian cricket authorities as to why the stadium experience of fans has to be, be so terrible. So that's what we're hearing from the fans. The other, there, there's another piece of information I got from a fan in the stadium who talked about WhatsApp groups that market black, that that sell black market tickets on the black market, and I'll I'll, I'll be talking about that uh, maybe a little later once the semi-final tickets come up for sale. We'll, and I'll tell you the prices and all that once that comes up. Um, finally, uh, in the last segment, a, a little piece. This happened in Bangalore. We were banned from wearing black shirts. So the public was banned from wearing black shirts. Uh, somebody wore uh, and uh, bought an Australian shirt to hide the fact that they were they were wearing a black shirt inside. And uh, the, the fan was told to remove the Australian shirt, remove the black shirt and then put the um, and then put the yellow Australian shirt back on again. Uh, there was no explanation for why this was not happening. Uh, the as to why there was why people were protesting about uh, why there was no explanation for why there were to be no black shirts. But we understood that it had something to do with political protest, whether it was against the state government of the day, whether it's against the central government of the day, or as somebody else said, uh, it was uh, against it was uh, against the actions of, against Palestinians um, in, in Gaza. And uh, so that is seen as one of the reasons. But as I always say, I'm trying uh, not to think it's political. I'll see you next time.